Hi Trevor, say, thanks again for agreeing to meet me. I wanted to start today really with really a few simple questions. And uh, you know, as we, as we go more into detail, ask you more about technology and maybe some other technologies as well. Uh, so Trevor, what is electrowinning of metals and when do I need to use it? Uh, Electrowinning of metals is it's, it's an electrolytic process uh, that involves the use of an anode and a cathode and an electrolyte and we apply a voltage across the anode and cathode and what that does is uh, allows the metal of interest, uh, it could be copper, it could be silver, nickel, cobalt, to plate onto the cathode and allows us to uh, recover those metals from solution. Uh, your second question was, how can it be used in uh, wastewater treatment? Um, so in some wastewaters, uh, you'll find uh, contaminated metals such as uh, silver. Uh, it could be uh, copper, for example, in semiconductor electrolytes. And so what we can do is use electrowinning to recover uh, the copper uh, from those solutions, for example, and reuse that copper elsewhere in the process. Uh, so. I hear a lot about electro refining. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to understand the difference. So what what is basically what's so different? The main main difference between electro winning and electro refining. That's a great question, Alex, and we get that all the time. Uh, so electro winning is actually where the metal is dissolved into the electrolyte uh, in the first place, um, and then the applying the voltage across the anode and cathode allows that metal to be recovered. In electro refining, however the anode rather than being an inert anode like it is in electrowinning is actually composed of the metal of interest but in an impure form so for example in a copper refinery the anodes in a copper refinery are impure anodes that are cast from smelted copper and the cathode uh, is the pure form of that and typically lme uh, london metal exchange uh, copper so basically the metal from the anode will dissolve during, during the process of uh, electro-refining and later you will take it out and you will have to recast it again and in, in, in the meanwhile bring a new anode and, and repeat the electro-refining process. That's exactly right. So what happens is the, the anode is electrochemically corroded uh, into solution and then replated again on the cathode in a pure form. So how is emu electro-winning different from conventional electro-winning? So in conventional electrowinning, what you have is a stagnant bath, typically, or uh, a slowly moving bath of electrolyte with alternating anodes and cathodes, planar anodes and cathodes in that electrolyte bath. Uh, in emu electrowinning, what we have is we've changed the configuration of the anode and cathode. The anode and cathode are annular, or uh, cylinders, and what we do is it's a, com it's a uh, entirely uh, enclosed cell with end caps uh, that enclose the anode and the cathode and we pump the electrolyte through the cell at a very high rate. And what that does is that it significantly improves the mass transfer um, and allows us to deplete down to much lower concentrations than you can with conventional electrowinning uh, as well as maintaining a high degree of purity of the product. And, and it's supposedly safe because the the cell is enclosed, so there is no acid mist. In Absolutely, and that's a real key differentiator, Alex, is that it's a much safer method. Um, acid mist is something that is, is very often found in conventional electrowinning and electrorefining cells, um, and acid mist is formed by the generation of oxygen at the anode, and when those oxygen bubbles reach the surface, um, they explode, releasing acid mist into, or not, not, not explode, but they burst and release that acid mist into the environment. Uh, in an emu cell, it's a completely enclosed cell, and so you don't have those issues with acid mist because everything uh, is vented back to the feed tank, uh, which may have a, a, a mist eliminator on, on the feed tank, but uh, it completely eliminates the problems associated with acid mist. So. Which metals can emu recover? Typically the sweet spot, as I'd say, for, for emu are copper, silver, nickel, cobalt, tin, uh, gold if it's, if it's associated with silver because silver acts as a collector for gold in the case of electrowinning. Um, 
and some other metals, uh, but really depends on, on particular application. But those are the, really the key, the key metals that are sweet spots for emu. Now, assuming I have certain impurities in, uh, in my solution, how would I go about it? Some impurities are okay. Some other impurities are a little bit more detrimental, uh, not only for emu, but for electrowinning in general. One of the main ones that when a customer asks us, uh, can I recover a particular metal from a particular solution, we often ask, first of all, is there any iron? And what is the form of the iron in? And the reason for that is because of the ferric-ferrous redox couple. And so what happens is the ferric, or the Fe3+, uh, will reduce uh, at the cathode, and then it'll be oxidized again at the anode. So you just have this circular process that doesn't do anything but consume electricity. So the more ferric iron there is in solution, uh, the more difficult it'll be to electrowin because we'll have a lot lower current efficiency, and it can also impact the purity of the product. Some of the other uh, impurities that we're concerned about are, are halides, uh, particularly chloride, uh, which can um, be corrosive and will cause problems with, with corrosion of, of the stainless steel um, cathode and starter sheets. Um, fluoride is also uh, one that we're concerned about, uh, particularly as it relates to the anode and the mixed metal coating on our titanium anodes, and it can be quite detrimental to that. So we want to keep the fluoride and the chlorides down as low as possible, and uh, as well as the iron. Those are really the main ones that we're most interested in. The other thing is, uh, with, with respect to other impurities, uh, metal impurities are not so important for EMU um, because we're, we significantly improve the mass transfer, so really the metals are going to play it in the order of the electrochemical series. Uh, so if we're looking at copper, for example, in the presence of high concentrations of zinc, zinc has uh, a much more negative reduction potential than copper, and so copper will always plate preferentially in the presence of zinc. So we always want to be look at the, uh, the impurities uh, or the, 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 the complete chemical profile of what we're dealing with and the metal of interest, and from there we can uh, develop a process to recover those metals. Can EMU process uh, solid feeds? Absolutely. Um, in the case of solid feeds, what we need to do is digest them. Uh, it could be into an acidic or a caustic uh, medium, and from there we can electrowin. But in, in for electrowinning, <coughs> excuse me, the metal always needs to be dissolved into the electrolyte first. Right. It's it's always um, has to be a solution form. That's right. Now, <coughs> uh, on the website you're talking about small mines. Uh, so I wonder what's the smallest capacity that the customer can come and purchase in order to process feed from, from small mines? We get that question a lot, Alex, and <clears throat> really um, because of the modular nature of EMU, we're able to uh, offer a much uh, <clears throat> smaller uh, unit than, say, a conventional uh, setup. So normally what we're talking about for small mines is anything under about 10,000 tons per annum. This could be a demonstration uh, for a larger, <coughs> a major miner, if you will, uh, where they want to demonstrate a particular technology or, or a particular deposit that they're interested in. Or it could be a, a, a junior miner or, or um, an, in, an independent miner that is really looking to develop a, a smaller deposit on their own. Uh, and perhaps maybe looking to then sell that off as, as a demonstrated process. So generally for a small mines, we'd say anything less than about 10,000 ton per annum. Thanks. Uh, what level of purity can be achieved uh, with Amy technology? So the purity really depends on the feed material and the impurities that are present. And <clears throat> But normally uh, we say uh, 49, which is 99.99, .99, it's very easily achieved for, for emu, uh, particularly for silver and copper. Um, in some cases, we can also achieve as high as five nines for silver, um, which is very important, for example, for silver refineries. What is the smallest concentration of metals that uh, emu can work with? And I know that you have a few different uh, cells, and each cell will work with different concentrations, so maybe you could, could elaborate on this. Sure. So. With, with EMU, we really have three different types of cells uh, in, in very broad terms. Uh, one is a plating cell, and a plating cell is really ideal for higher concentrations of metals. So it could be 
uh, anywhere from greater than say 30 gram per liter down to say 5 gram per liter uh, is ideal for the plating cell. Uh, <coughs> at lower concentrations we have a cell uh, that's called the, the powder cell. And the powder cell is really good for concentrations between about 1 to 5 gram per liter. But really what that does, and, and this is for more for base metals uh, as well as for silver, uh, but what the powder cell allows us to do is to, to generate a, a, a loose deposit that, that resembles powder. Below that we're really looking at the, the polishing cell, uh, below about 1 gram per liter. The polishing cell uh, uses a three-dimensional cathode. Um, with a high surface area and that allows us to get down to the part per million range. So generally less than 10 part per million with a polishing cell. Thanks. Uh, so let's, let's say a customer purchased a plant. How long would it normally take to deliver and commission a plant? Really depends on the size of the plant. Uh, but generally uh, from the time an order and deposit is received, uh, we can have the, the equipment uh, delivered X works uh, in around 10 to 16 weeks, depending on the size of the plant, uh, depending on where it is in the world. Um, we're usually looking at another four to six weeks to, to deliver that to site, uh, and then another uh, two to maybe six weeks to uh, install and commission the plant, again, depending on the size. So generally, we're looking at about um, uh, anywhere from uh, three to six months uh, from the time an order is received until the plant is delivered and installed. How long would it take me to train uh, employees and how many employees will I need to run the plant? Uh, <clears throat> to train the employees uh, happens during, during the commissioning. Uh, we'll have a team on site which uh, assists with the, the installation and provides the commissioning services. And at that time they'll also train the operators on how to operate and, and maintain the plant. Uh, the number of operators required really, again, depends on the size of the plant. So the larger the plant, the, the more operators you're going to require. Um, with our powder plants are fully automated, and so there's not a lot of uh, labor that's required other really just to maintain, uh, you know, o o oversee the, the operation of the plant, um, the, the regular maintenance, and of course the harvesting of the powder product. For our uh, plating cells, uh, the, uh, the most labor that's required is really to harvest um, and generally we say that's about one to one and a half uh, man hours per ton of copper recovered. Thanks. And now I guess the most interesting part for everyone, how is you priced and what defines the price? What can customer expect in a matter of pricing? Well I've mentioned a couple times uh, really things depend a lot on the, the size of the plant. Um, and the other thing that, that's dependent on is the type of metal that we're looking to recover. Uh, if it's copper, what's the concentration of the copper? Are we looking at a plating plant versus a powder plant? Plating plants are generally more cost effective compared to a powder plant because it doesn't have all the automation and the PLC and that type of thing. Um, but because it's modular, it's easy to just add on, add on cells. So. <clears throat> um, that's something that, that's a bit of a it depends type answer uh, because it's going to depend on the metal, uh, the current density because um, if we have a higher concentration of metal in solution we can generally operate at a higher current density which means the number of cells that we need to recover that metal uh, is much smaller. If we have a lower concentration we may need to dial that current density back. Uh, in which case we'll need more cells in order to recover the same amount of copper. So it really is uh, a case by case, but uh, our sales team can really uh, help our customers uh, determine what the, the best process philosophy and obviously then what, what the price of that plant would look like. And I think you, you released recently a blog post with actually a few examples of how the pricing is calculated based on, on certain kind of plant with certain types of solutions. That's right, Alex, and that's a really good reference point for customers because it really demonstrates what I was just talking about, where uh, the pricing really depends on uh, the metal of interest, the concentration, uh, and the application. Uh, that's all I had for today. Thanks a lot, Trevor, for talking to me today, and I hope to catch up with you again soon. Pleasure, Alex. Thank you. Thank you.